Happy New Year, Church! My name's Marielle. We hope that your New Year celebrations were a wonderful time to look back at the way God has blessed you over the last year. I'd like to share with you some of the ways you can connect in community over the coming weeks. Church, as we begin a new year, we have an exciting opportunity for you. Life Shared is three online sessions to encourage and equip everyone in the church to share their faith. Through biblical teaching from leading Christian voices and real stories of invitation, each session explores what it means to live out God's call, to share our lives and our faith with friends, colleagues, and neighbors. Life Shared starts on January 31st. Visit thepeopleschurch.ca for more info and to register. This year might be the year that you are hoping to connect deeper in community here at Peoples, and we have some great opportunities for you to join a life group, attend a discipleship course, or maybe you want to serve on a team. If that sounds like you, we have some new opportunities starting throughout January. Visit thepeopleschurch.ca for ways on how you can connect today. Church, let's continue to be inspired and challenged for God's global mission. We are together in God's global mission to reach everyone, everywhere. As we experience Christ, embrace community, and engage globally, we are made one. In Jesus' name, we praise, pray, learn, and serve. Together, we are peoples. Happy New Year! My name is Benson Ochen, and we are celebrating New Year with you in Uganda. And we are part of the team of I Live Again Uganda, where the Lord has called us to build peace through trauma counseling, discipleship, resettlement, and community development. We are glad to be part of the People's Church Global Family. And this morning, as we are going to begin our worship, I will be taking our reading from a Tully Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 18. And mumio kangan mo tiye i Christo, en dong beru gen ma ikar manyen, gen ma chan dong no uro nyo wako, gen ma nyen dong ule kakare. Meno dujo beru tij malo bano tiyo, ma yam udu wako wakwere bore, be Christo, dok bene umiye wa tij met wako dano bore. Let us worship the Lord who makes all things new. Amen. He makes all things new. Happy New Year, church. Yeah. Happy New Year to all of you at home who are with us as well online. It's so good to be together and to start this new year off worshiping our King. Amen. So God, we submit to you all our praise, all our lives, our thoughts, our actions. May they bring you glory. We love you. And we worship you today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Church, would you stand to your feet if you are able and turn around and give someone a happy new year greeting today, would you? Come on.
the day or time, but we worship him today. Come on. So who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? You're strong, Lord. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? You are able. month of December we've been anticipating Christmas and celebrating Christmas the arrival of Jesus Messiah who came to save you and save me to save the lost this is good news for everyone and this is the plan of salvation let's sing this together he became sin who knew no sin we might become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing oh love so
of his great love for the whole world. Come on. together today taking communion so church please take your seats hello church happy new year it's crazy it's 2023 just yesterday it was 2022 <laughs> for those of you who don't know me my name's Andre and I'll be the 
serving and leading you in communion today. And isn't it cool that for the first day of the year, we get to be in church, in community, and communing with God together. Amen? And I always find this time of year kind of interesting because, you know, not too long ago, we were very focused on holiday traditions, and now we've transitioned to New Year's traditions. So, you know, just a week ago, it was Christmas, and in our culture, others celebrated Hanukkah or Kwanzaa. We focused on gift giving and gathering. And as a church community, we focused on the wonder, the peace, the glory of God, and Him sending Jesus, His Son, to ransom or transform our lives. But now, it's all about New Year's traditions. We're thinking about ways in which we can kind of make things better than last year, ways in which we can improve our lives. And we think of things and we, we come up with ways to do it, and we call them New Year's resolutions, right? And these New Year's resolutions are usually things that we say we're going to start to do now that we wouldn't do just two days ago, but because it's a new year, we do it. And there's things that are important to us like, you know, bettering or improving our lives and our families, our finances, our faith, our friendships, our fitness, and a whole host of other things. And that's, that's okay. But today, as we commune with God and we think of those New Year's resolutions that will improve our lives, my prayer is that we would think of the new covenant that makes our lives new. We would think of Jesus' blood and the new covenant that was shed for us on the cross that just doesn't make us a little better. He made us completely new. He transforms us into who he designed us to be. And he does this when we believe in the body, which we're going to eat in this cracker soon, and we believe in his blood, which we're going to drink in the juice, both as symbols of him sacrificing everything because of, as we sang, he loves us. And when we believe, we believe he transforms our lives by giving us himself, God the Spirit. And that Spirit makes our lives new. He works in us and through us. And so my prayer is, as we think of all the things that we're going to resolve to do in our own strength, all the things that we're putting pressure on ourselves and those around us to do this new year as resolutions, we would surrender them to God and ask him his plan for our year. And I even wonder, as we surrender our new year's resolutions and our plans for our future to him, which ones would he say yes to? Which ones would he maybe turn from being about us to being about others? So this morning, as we're about to take the cracker, I pray that we would reflect on surrendering our New Year's resolutions to Jesus because his new covenant brings us not just improved life, but new life. Amen? So for those of you that believe you are going to have a package and we're going to open up the top. Maybe you're having as much trouble as I am. And if you're at home, you know, feel free to get something like bread or leftover pizza. <laughs> and let's partake. Because as we know in the Gospel of Matthew, in Mark and Luke, and Paul speaks of it also in Corinthians, during the Last Supper or the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, 
He blessed it, he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that you spare nothing for us because your, your immense love for us. And help us to remember that as we go through this new year. As the Gospels write, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he offered it to them, and they all drank from it, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. Let us drink. And Heavenly Father, we thank you so much again for your willingness to give it all, to sacrifice yourself for sinners such as us. You took the punishment that we deserved so we could be reconnected back to God, that the Spirit could indwell us once again and help us to live this year surrendered to your Spirit and your will for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Isn't it amazing that God would love us? <laughs> amazing that God sent his one and only son for us. <laughs> amazing that God sent his one and only son for us. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. We sing our praise to you.
Thank you, God, in advance for 2023 and all that you're going to do. We give you our lives, our worship today. Restore to us the joy of our salvation and renew a steadfast spirit to sustain us, your people, your church, your children, your bride. We love you, Lord. We live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, don't sit down just yet. <laughs> It is so, so nice to see all of you here, all of you up here, and to know that you are joining us online as well. It's very special to be together today, isn't it? So we were just singing about being amazed at what God has done for us. And so I want you to spend just a quick second and think back to 2022 and think about how you would answer this question. What is something amazing that you saw or experienced last year? What is one amazing thing that you saw or experienced last year? Okay, put that in your mind. And what I want you to do is turn to someone, ideally someone you don't know already, and tell them your name, start with that, and say, what is that amazing thing you saw or experienced last year? Go ahead. <laughs> and if you're online, you can type it into the chat window. Please have a seat when you're done. So see if you can remember that person's name and you can pick up the conversation later. So you may, like me, have found it hard to decide and figure out just one thing, but I wanted to offer some encouragement, which I read in Psalm 71 just the other day. It says there that my mouth will tell of your righteous deeds of your saving acts all day long, though I know not its measure. Or in another translation, although I don't know how to relate them all, or even, even though I'm not skilled with words. And so I encourage you that, I love that the Bible knows that we may not feel really eloquent or so philosophical or have it all figured out. But the Bible does say, yes, come, praise, proclaim about what God has done in your life and how powerful and how wonderful that is. Let that praise bubble out of you. And so I want to welcome if you, if you are new in particular. And so after the service, we would welcome you um, to go over to the Connection Center just behind these doors so that we can get to know you and that you can also get to know our church and how to get more involved. And I know today there's families and kids with us. Hi, all the kids. And so we welcome you that if you guys, um, if the kids just need a little bit more freedom or space, feel free to head out to the um, cafe or to Founders Hall if any families need that. Um, you can just ask the ushers where, they're, where that is for this service. 
So we're also glad that you're here today because we also want to share with you about some of the beautiful things that are happening at People's Church and also with our brothers and sisters around the world. So at our recent staff Christmas gathering, I went and just asked some of um, my colleagues, what are some of your highlights from the year uh, in your ministry area? And everyone kind of had this um, wondrous pause and looked off into the distance. And just like you, all these wonderful things started coming out about how they have seen themselves transformed and how we've seen transformation through the power of God in so many of you. And we talked about baptisms, family de dedications, premix, remix, all of these beautiful things that show that God is definitely at work in and through us. And so to kind of continue supporting the work that's happening here at People's, you can give tithes and offerings to the church ministries. You can also support things in the community through the benevolent offering, and also support the work of our mission partners here in Canada and worldwide through the um, Global Mission Fund. So there's many simple and secure ways to do that. You can do it through text by texting the word People's Give to 77977, that's the number. Or if you brought your gift um, in person, you can drop it off outside. So at the start of the year, why don't we bow in prayer to the Lord? Dear Lord, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, that you were here since the beginning. You were here when our planet started a new trip around the sun. You were here even before our world and before time were even created. But thank you that you, Creator, humbled yourself in obedience to your Father and out of sheer love for us. You made yourself nothing. You didn't come as a wise sage, but you came as an infant, not born to some rich elite family, but taking on the nature of a servant, dying the death of a criminal that was meant for us, but then conquering death. And you knew that we could do nothing on our own, by our own strength. And so you did it for us. And now you are humble enough to live in us and walk with us in our messy lives and sometimes bad hearts, that you are transforming them, that you are transforming through the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we put away all the stuff of Christmas, help us to not shelve our wonder Although the sparkly lights are put back in their boxes, Lord, help us to marvel at your creation and then worship you as our creator and sustainer. May the amazement of our death to life make us want to jump out of bed every morning just as much as Christmas Day. And then, just like the song says, your power and your glory evermore proclaim. And Lord, we lay before you the plans that we might have. And Lord, help our ambition and our striving not to run ahead of your grace. Forgive us when we think of ourselves too, more highly than we ought. But whoever we are, men and women, young and aged, joyful or downcast, thank you for inviting us to your table. And so Lord, with bowed heads and bowed hearts and open hands, May this be our posture for all the days before that you grant us. We pray all of this, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, church, we're so thankful to have our brother Peter here with us. Let's open, our word, open the word of God and our hearts to listen to him today. Thanks, Thank Fiona. you. Yeah. Thanks, Fiona. Thanks, worship team. Yeah. Good morning, church family. Yeah. Good morning. Happy New Year. I hope everyone had a good Christmas. Okay. Let's uh, go to God again in prayer. Lord, we thank you for being able to come before you as Fiona has led us in prayer already this morning. We come because we are hungry for you. We are thirsty for you. And we ask that you would meet us that you would open our eyes and show us wonderful things from your law, 
We also ask that you would continue to pour forth your grace and your spirit upon our church in the coming year. That you would draw us closer to you, that you would show yourself in a more deeper and profound way, your glory, your wonder, and we ask that we would share that and radiate that to people around us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. I thought what we would do after two weeks of eating is <laughs> I'm going to show you a highlight video that reminds us of where uh, Brett and Pastor Sandra have taken us in the last couple of weeks in our worship time. Now I'm going to play that song for you because this is the song that came to mind when I thought, wow, he's given us everything. I'm going to click this button and that song is going to play. So picture me just losing my mind in Starbucks as we listen to this. We have an amazing lead pastor, <laughs> and I'm presuming on his grace as well, so thanks. January can be a difficult time. We've opened all our presents, we've eaten lots of food, and then we crash land back into our lives. But what I want to encourage you to do this year is try something new. Hold on to what Brett and Sandra have taught us the last two weeks. Brett showed us the glory of God is in us. And then Sandra opened our eyes to the wonder of God that is around us. And then today, I hope you will see that God, God's eyes and ears are on us. Our text today is Genesis 16. It is a story of Hagar. And it describes a God who sees and hears. When God sees, it is more than just being aware of our existence. When God sees, he cares. For God to see, he cares. And when he cares, he acts. Our story begins with the two words, now Sarah. Those two words indicate that we're into the next episode of the Abraham story. And to recap what has gone on before, you need to look at the preceding chapters. And there we find that Abraham has been given a command. Go, leave your people to a distant and unfamiliar land. But the command is paired with a promise. The promise has three parts. I will give you land, I will give you lots of descendants and make them into a great nation. I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. There's a problem though. All the promises depend on Abraham having a son and he doesn't have one. There's a little short verse at the end of chapter 11 where we find that Sarah was barren, she had no children. The repetition emphasizes the comprehensiveness of Sarah's childlessness. She was barren, she had no children. Now, what are the options for Abraham to have a son? He could have a son with Sarah. He could have a son with a woman other than Sarah, or just not Sarah. Now, one option is adoption. He could adopt a relative, Lot. He could adopt a trusted servant. That was a custom in the ancient Near East. If it's with another woman, he could pursue surrogacy. An ancient Eastern custom was Abraham would sleep with one of his wife's maidservants. The child that was born would be classified or considered as Sarah's. Another option was he could take a second wife. In Genesis 13, God eliminates Lot. He's not a candidate, Abraham, sorry. 
In chapter 15, God eliminates Eliezer, the trusted servant that Abraham thought he was now having to adopt. The other thing God makes very clear in Genesis 15 is that son would come from Abraham. But he was silent about who the mother would be. Abraham, you're going to be the father. He doesn't say anything about who the mother will be. That is where things stand when we enter chapter 16. In the first two verses, we're introduced to the characters that will be in our story. The first character is Sarah. She's introduced by her given name. Then we are told her position, her relationship. She is Abraham's wife. The next thing we're told creates tension. She's Abraham's wife, but she had borne him no children. There is a contrast between her role as the wife and her childlessness. The ancient Near East was a time and a culture where a woman's esteem and her identity and her worth was tied to her ability to have children. She has the role of being the wife, but she is unable to fulfill her expected role of bearing children. If you look, into, look ahead in chapter 3, we find out that Genesis 16 happens 10 years after they first enter Canaan. Verse 1 can actually be translated, now Sarah, Abram's wife, still had borne him no children. The introduction to Sarah emphasizes her childlessness. But all the promises depend on having a son. The next thing we find out is what Sarah does have. She doesn't have children, but she has an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Then we're introduced to her perspective on her situation. The Lord has kept me from having children. She acknowledges that this is God's hand at work. There is no question, there's no debate. God has prevented me from having children. God has said no to Sarah. When God says no, the no can be in several forms. There can be the definitive never, ever no. The no can be the no of not yet, or not this, or not this way. The only way we find out which type of no it is, we have to wait. But Sarah is not willing to wait. Go, sleep with my slave, perhaps I can build a family through her. On the one hand, she acknowledges God has said no. On the other hand, she's rejecting that no. She is reaching out and taking what God has said is off limits to her. Now, if you remember, very early on, two other individuals reached out and took something that God said, you cannot have this. There are echoes of Genesis 3 running through the story that we're going to go through today. And this is the first point of reflection for us this morning. What is our response when God says no? What is our response when God says no? Do we accept it? in trust, trusting that God is good. He is not cruel. He is not withholding something from us. God is good. And that we trust that the no is for our good. Or do we reject his no and defiantly take, go, and do, and be what we want? What is our response when God says no. Let me illustrate this point. So, imprisoned in this cage with a lock on the door is 
fried chicken. <laughs> God and my wife and my girls have said, no fried chicken for you, Peter. <laughs> now, I can accept the no from God and my wife and my girls, trusting that they're good and that the no is good for me. I should not be having the fried chicken. Or I can say, I want my fried chicken. And I know the door is locked. I'm going to find a way to get my fried chicken. I'm going to push back against the no because I'm rejecting God, my wife, and my girls. Now, we all know what will happen if I break into this and eat the fried chicken. The ushers are going to have to grab the automatic defibrillator. When God says no, what is our response? The next character we introduced to is Hagar. We're told four things about Hagar. She's Egyptian, she's a slave, and then at the very end, we're told her name, which is different from how we're introduced to Sarah. We're given Sarah's name from the beginning. But Peter, I thought you said there were four things. You have to read very carefully. She, Sarah, had an Egyptian slave. The fourth thing about Hagar and the first thing in her description is she's a possession. Sarah had her. She's owned by somebody. And that's why her name is pushed to the very end of her description. Her identity, her personhood is overshadowed by the fact that she belongs to someone else. She has no right, no voice, nothing. She's owned. This is our introduction to Hagar. The last character is Abram. It's a very short introduction. Abram listened to what Sarah said. Who should Abram have been listening to? Remember, the last time, some, last time God said no, two people listened to an individual other than God. The echoes of Genesis 3 are running through this. What is our response when God says no? Abram brings us to our second point of reflection. As we enter the new year, who are we listening to? What voices are we listening to? Who are we not listening to? Headphones are wonderful. You put them on, you might not even be listening to anything, but you're telling people, leave me alone. <laughs> but headphones allow us to hear the voice we want to hear and they block out all the other noise. Who are we listening to? Are we focused and tuned in to God? And are we able to block out all the other noise, all the other voices? Well, to carry out the plot, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. Notice the verbs, took and gave. Hagar's an object. Okay? And the dynamics within the family are turned upside down. The slave girl now becomes a wife. The wife has to share her husband, co-wife. Maybe she might consider herself the first wife, but she's also the older wife. Okay? And you actually wonder, did Sarah really give Hagar to Abraham? Or did she give Abraham away to the servant girl? In the same way Abraham gave her away to Pharaoh several chapters earlier. Hagar gets pregnant. 
And as the reader, you know, this is not going to end well. <laughs> because the slave girl started off beneath her mistress. Once she was married and became a wife, she's equal to her mistress. As soon as she gets pregnant, her status is now above her mistress. The reader knows this is not going to end well at all. Sure enough, when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Sarah is not happy. And she lashes out at everybody around her. Abraham, it's your fault. You are responsible. Echoes of Genesis 3. It's not my fault. It's your fault. Okay? Sarah, I'm the victim. The wrong that I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now she knows she is pregnant. She despises me. Sarah is not taking responsibility for her actions. What she is emphasizing is her victim status. I did this for you, Abram. I did this for us so that we could have a son, and now look what has happened. She lashes out at Hagar. She despises me. And then lastly, she invites God into the conflict. She invokes God's judgment because she believes in the rightness of her position. I'm right, and I'm going to ask God to verify and vindicate that I'm right. It's very interesting that she never invited God into her childlessness in verse 2. But now when her scheme blows up, she invites God. Abraham's response, same thing as before. He listens to his wife. He says three things. Your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. In those three statements, Abraham produces four effects in the family now. First, he has demoted Hagar from being his wife back to being a servant. Second, by doing so, in effect, he divorces her. You're no longer my wife. You are back to being Sarah's servant. Third, that leaves Hagar defenseless. She's no longer under the authority and the protection of Abraham. And fourth, besides no longer being her husband, Abraham abdicates his role as the head of the household. He is not there to affirm justice and fairness. He washes his hands. Sarah, do whatever you want. And Sarah does. She mistreats Hagar. And the word mistreat is the same word that we find in Exodus to describe the treatment of the Israelites by the Egyptians. Mistreat, deal harshly, to oppress Hagar runs. She runs into the desert. Now, let's stop for a moment and take stock of who actually runs into the desert. You have a young person, a young female. She's Egyptian, which means she's an outsider. She's not part of Abraham's family. She's a servant. She's pregnant and divorced and a single mom. She's running away from abuse. She's a refugee. She's a mess. And she runs into the desert. Who would care if she died? Nobody except God. And that's exactly what happens. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring. Now, the angel of the Lord is a character that appears about 50, 60 times in the Old Testament. It is God appearing in human form in the Old Testament. What's debated is which person of the Trinity. Is it God the Father showing up or God the Son showing up? Okay? But I think the bottom line is God shows up in visible form. And he visits with us. This is the very first appearance 
of the angel of the Lord in Scripture. And it is to Hagar that he appears. Young woman, servant, single mom, pregnant, divorced, outsider. He doesn't appear to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. He appears to Hagar. First visit, it's to her. He says seven words to her. And in those seven words, what I hope you will see is that when God sees and God hears, he cares. And when he cares, he acts. The first thing he says is, Hagar. In contrast to how she was defined in verse 1 and verse 3, he doesn't say, hey, Egyptian maidservant Hagar. He actually places her name, her given name at the very beginning because he is affirming her personhood. I see you, Hagar, not the Egyptian, not the maidservant, not the single mom, not the divorcee. I see you, Hagar. But he does go on and say, maidservant of Sarah. He affirms her place. And that is followed up by two rhetorical questions. Where have you come from? Where are you going? The angel knows where she came from. He identifies her by name. He says, you're a slave girl. Your mistress is Sarah. The question is put to Hagar. You're not where you're supposed to be. And that's the third point of reflection I have for us this morning. Where have we come from? Where are we going? Are we where we are supposed to be? Where are we going? Are we where we're supposed to be? And then God gives her two commands. The first command is, go back. You got to be kidding me. I was expecting rescue, redemption. Go back, return. If you look ahead in the verse 11, the Lord has heard of your misery. God knew exactly the circumstances she was in, and he's saying, go back to your misery. In fact, second command, submit to your mistress. The phrase literally is, put yourself underneath her hand. Not only go back, but God actually calls out Hagar, hey, your attitude was wrong, and you precipitated this conflict. Change your attitude. God's presence can be assuring. God's presence is also disturbing because he holds us to account. But he's sending Hagar back, and what he's doing in effect is he is now saying no to her. I'm not letting you leave. I want you to go back. And just like he has said no to Sarah, he's saying no to Hagar. You can't leave. Now, we know five chapters later that God's no was a not yet. She will leave, just not now. But for now, God said no. Go back. He's not finished. He gives her a promise. You will have a multitude of descendants. They'll be a great nation. That promise is similar in scope and magnitude to Abram's. No other woman in the Old Testament receives such a promise. It really elevates Hagar to the status of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is a young female Egyptian slave girl single mom, divorcee, who receives this incredible promise. The promise is backed up with a down payment of a prophecy. And in the prophecy, God starts with the present. You're pregnant. The baby will be a boy. In fact, I have a name for that boy because in that name, I want you to remember all the days of your life that I care for you. 
Ishmael, God hears. Because when God hears, he cares. The prophecy goes on. It's bittersweet. It describes the character, relationships, and life of this son. The analogy of, of a wild donkey refers to the fact that this son will have a nomadic, independent, strong-willed existence. God also refers to hostility and the desire to be different. But nevertheless, this is an amazing gift that he gives her. What's Sarah's response? She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And then she names the well accordingly. Sarah's response is one of worship. In contrast, sorry, Hagar's response is one of worship in contrast to Sarah's when God says no. Hagar's realized, I'm not just talking to a regular man. This is God. And she understood that this God had showed up, made himself known to her, and cared for her. And in response, she worships. Now, she couldn't bring anything as a sacrifice, as an offering. She had nothing. What she gives God is a name. She is the first and only person in Scripture to give God a name. The audacity, the boldness, but also the innocence. She didn't know you couldn't give God a name. She just went ahead and did it as an expression of her worship and her gratitude. You are the God who sees me. What she is really saying is, you are the God who cares for me. In her explanation, I have now seen the one who sees me. She is voicing, I have met. I now know the God who cares for me. For, she understood that for God to see, it meant that God cared for her. Why should she worship? Her circumstances haven't changed. God said, go back to the misery of your life and submit, change your attitude to your mistress. She worshipped because Hagar realized what she didn't need was removal from her circumstances. What she needed was God who cared for her. And in response to that meeting of God, she worships him. What happened to her in the desert by the side of the road in the spring was her burning bush experience. Just like Saul, Paul meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, she met God and her life was changed forever. The story ends very quickly. Hagar bore Abram a son. Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Hagar returns to Abram and Sarah as God commanded her. Uh, God fulfills his promise, the son is born. And Abram names the son Ishmael, implying that Hagar probably told him what had happened, what the angel had said to her. And Abram believed the truth of what the angel had said. Notice who's missing at the end of the story. Sarah dominates the story with all of her manipulation. At the end of the story, Sarah's absent, Sarah is silent. For all of her manipulation and scheming, she's out of the picture. Why are we told Abraham's 86 years old? Because there's actually a trailer to the story, which you find in the next chapter. So if you, if you wait for the credits to roll and you keep waiting, chapter 17 pops up, little two-minute trailer. What you find out 
In chapter 17, Abraham is now 99 years old. The age, 86 and 99, are given to us so that we know how old Ishmael is. He's 13. For 13 years, Abraham and Sarah think Ishmael is the son, the promised son. Sarah thinks her plan worked. She outmaneuvered God. And then in chapter 17, God drops the bombshell. It's not Ishmael. I'm going to give you a son a year from now. You, Sarah and Abraham, you too will have a, a son. God can let us continue down our road of disobedience for 13 years or longer. It was an act of grace that he broke into their lives and corrected their course. He didn't have to. What is our response when God says no? Think very carefully about that. Let me close by going over the four reflective points that I had. The first is, whose voice are we listening to? Whose voice are we not listening to? The second question, where are we going? Am I where I'm supposed to be? The third question, do I see the way God sees? When God sees, it's more than just awareness of existence. When he sees, he cares. And because he cares, he acts. When I see the people around me, do I care? Do I act to change their circumstances? I love what Fiona had us do when she uh, it welcomed us. She had us share with the people around us something that happened in our lives. That's part of seeing finding out the names of the people that we sit with, finding out what their jobs are, what their families are like. Do we see? The fourth question is, what is our response when God says no? Do we trust that he's good and the no is for our good? Or do we say, no, God, I'm going to say no to your no. I'm going to take and do and go and be what I want. The last question. Who cares about us? Remember who Hagar is. She's young. You may be thinking, I'm young or I'm old. God doesn't care about me. Hagar's young She's a woman. She's Egyptian. She's an outsider. She's a servant girl. Single mom, pregnant, divorced. She's running away from abuse. She's a refugee. She's a mess. Not someone you would think the God of the universe would care about. But he did. Hagar's story points to the ultimate demonstration of God's care and love for us, and that is Jesus Christ, who we have been celebrating over this Christmas holiday. For God so loved the world that he gave his son, that whoever, all-inclusive, comprehensive, the world, whoever, and then it's extremely exclusive, believes in him. Sarah said, I have met the God who cares for me. Do you want to meet the God who cares for you? I think on January 1st, 
If you don't know this God who cares for you, this is a great opportunity to meet that God. And if you do know that God, Make the decision, I want to know you more. I want to know more about how you care for me so that I can tell others. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the story of Hagar and how you saw her. And in the seeing of her, was your care for her and your actions in her life. We ask that you would help us to meet you, maybe for the first time, or to meet you and know you in a deeper way in this coming year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Peter, for helping us, for knowing God so well and for helping us to know him better. So, friends, would you stand as we just close our service? I just have a few, few announcements uh, before I send you off with a blessing. So as Peter said, if you would like to pray with someone, then please, would you stay behind after service? You can come up to the front and a member of our prayer team will come and pray with you. If you're online, you can do that as well. There should be a request, but, request prayer button that you can click. If you want to continue some conversations with people, or if you're new, you can, you're welcome to do that outside. And lastly, I just want to um, bless you and pray with you a prayer that I'm certainly praying myself for this new year ahead from Psalm 71 that we talked about earlier. It says here, and we pray this, but as for us, we will always have hope. We will praise you, Lord Jesus, more and more. Our mouths will tell of your righteousness, of your salvation all day long. Though we cannot know its full measure, and even if we aren't skilled with words, but we will come and proclaim your mighty acts, O sovereign Lord. We will proclaim your righteousness, yours alone. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week, year. Thank you for being with us.